Well, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. And, and thank you to Kelly for inviting me to uh, have this conversation. I'm really excited uh, to, to talk to everybody and to get to get to meet some of you virtually. Um, so yeah, the topic that we're going to be covering today, um, I've had a few names for this over the years as I've, as I've used this, but it's essentially um, using what's called the system, uh, you know, using what's called the uh, systems thinking approach to implementing Kanban, but for non-Kanban teams and, and maybe specifically for Scrum teams. So it's a technique that I've been using for a while and uh, find it kind of interesting and helpful. Hopefully you will as well. Um, so a quick kind of disclaimer is that it's, it's been adapted. So I've, I've taken the, the model and I've adapted it over the years um, to, to kind of fit uh, some of the context of the teams that I've worked with. So as I'm going through it today, um, it's not gonna be a strict, pure, perfect definition of, of the static approach, uh, but it'll be sharing with you a little bit of how I've adapted it working with, with some teams. Uh, just a quick overview of me. I'm uh, Denver-based. Uh, so I'm an enterprise agile coach and trainer, um, and I work with a group of fine coaches and trainers at Agile Velocity. Um, and I've been practicing agile and lean for about 20 years. So I started uh, started learning about agile uh, in the early days as the manifesto was emerging and was experimenting with some things and um, starting to get really interested in it of uh, how it was helping me and my teams uh, deliver product and deliver value for our customers. And um, my first formal introduction was using extreme programming, XP. Um, and then I eventually learned more about Scrum and I just got hooked in the early days. That this was a better way of working. It was a better way of, of collaborating, et cetera. So I've, and kind of set my career path uh, to learn more about it. And I do consider myself a continuous learner. So even though I've been practicing this for many years and um, you know, have, have uh, achieved a certain level of success with it, I'm still learning new techniques and new ways of doing things every single day, which is pretty exciting to me. Uh, so again, what we're gonna be talking about is, is what's called static systems thinking approach to implementing Kanban. And what I'm showing you right now is, is kind of the official uh, steps that go through the static approach. Um, and again, this talk is really about how can we adapt this to either stand up new teams or reorient teams into understanding the work that they do. But a quick overview of the static model, it's got these steps uh, involved in it. And one of the things that I really love about this approach with static is you'll notice if you look down step six, says define the Kanban system. And I've, I've worked with a lot of organizations that are interested in applying Kanban method. And a lot of times what I see happening is, is they create a Kanban board and they say, oh great, we're using Kanban now because we have a Kanban board. And, and, and the cool thing about this approach is, is that that happens after we go through the exercises and have the conversations that we need to really understand uh, the nature of our work, understand the complexity, understand how work needs to flow. As we have these conversations, then we can design our Kanban system that would be supportive of that. And then obviously the last step is you roll it out and you rinse and repeat and you inspect and adapt. So, uh, as a framework, as, a, as an approach to rolling out a framework rather, I really enjoy it. Now, how do I adapt this with working with teams? So what I've done is I've created um, what I call a team chartering uh, agenda that I use in certain cases. Um, and again, I use this oftentimes when I go into an organization and whether we're talking about delivery teams or leadership teams, and if there's, there's a risk of, of churn that could happen, even though I'll just keep it in the context of Scrum teams as I've titled the talk, um, even though Scrum is a very lightweight framework and it doesn't introduce a ton of change, it does introduce some change, right? And the most obvious is, well, we have this new role called a Scrum master and we have this role called a product owner and the, and the development team and, and what does that really mean? 
And so what I found in some organizations, even those simple changes, those simple adaptations that need to happen to stand a team up and allow them to start working together and go through the normal forming and storming type activities um, can be a little bit disruptive and, and can stress the team out. So I've applied this approach to kind of cut through some of that and kind of help the team kind of understand how things work. Um, You'll see, I do have some, some uh, credits at the end. So David Anderson, who many of you may know who he is, he's kind of one of the thought leaders certainly of Kanban. Um, and so static as a model uh, certainly was not something I, I invented, but something that I've, I've adapted, as I've said. So what you're seeing here is essentially the agenda when I take uh, teams through uh, either an initial chartering, or maybe we need to again, reorient and get the team kind of refocused on their purpose. So for today, I'm gonna to step you through these a little bit. And I know we've got kind of a limited amount of time. Um, this workshop is typically done with a team as a full day workshop. Um, and so we wanna give teams appropriate time to, to dig in and do the work and have the conversations um, and then make sure that we get enough out of these so that they're confident that they can move forward as a team. Um, so just so I don't forget at the end of the talk, um, since this is a pretty high level uh, presentation, uh, feel free, anybody that's interested in learning more, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, after the presentation at any time. And I'd be happy to have a conversation with you, share some more depth and how you might apply this yourself with the teams that you're working with. So one of the things I, I do is I essentially stru uh, structure each of the steps within the chartering model that I've created um, as a story. Um, we're all familiar with the concept of user stories as Agilist. And so I try to put these in the form of a story so that it's familiar and also helps kind of get teams into that understanding of what the purpose of user story is. And uh, like any good user story, we have some acceptance criteria that we wanna to hope to achieve some outcomes that we're trying to achieve by doing this work. So I, I set up each of the, of the steps within the workshop that I'm running with teams so that they have that format and it, it kind of helps build on, on some of that mindset. And so the first step is in static referred to as fit for purpose. And what that really means is understanding um, what is the task that we're being asked or the product or the work that we're being asked to do and do we understand that well enough? And are we constructed in a way and organized in a way that we can actually serve that purpose, right? And so we have some questions that we'll take the team through and we start digging in to understand who are we as a team? Um, you know, are we being set up to succeed? Do we understand the nature of the work that we're gonna be doing? Uh, do we understand what the con conditions of success might be? And then we all, also start probing into getting an understanding of what our customers need. Um, and again, if we're a brand new team starting off, you know, we might not have all of that context yet. We might be making certain sets of assumptions and we might have to, to start leaning in in a certain way versus I've also used this method uh, with a lot of uh, long standing teams, teams that have been working for a while uh, as a way to kind of reorient and then in those cases, hopefully we have some empirical data that we can use and we can use that to start getting a better understanding of, of are we fit for purpose and how are we going to start to move forward? Um, one of the adaptations that I use at this step, uh, if you can see the first acceptance criteria is I wanna make sure we have a clear mission vi vision value type of a conversation and that the team has a strong sense of identity. Um, we're not just the you know, application team, or we're not just the project team. Um, hopefully we're gonna be a, a long lived team and, and we're gonna be able to work together over a long period of time. And so I think, I personally think it's important that teams have a sense of identity. And uh, quite frankly, I even encourage them to, to have fun with it and, and really kind of establish that um, as part of this first step. Um, I've got some templates that I use with the teams. I'm guessing most of you that are practitioners have various things that you've done with teams as well. And so whatever it takes for the team to feel confident that, that we understand the nature of the work that we're going to be doing uh, and the impacts that that might have on us and specifically can identify these are the conditions of success that we're gonna start with. And this is how we're gonna kind of form our identity is a good place to get them started. 
the next set of conversations we'll have as a team is we start understanding what's referred to as the sources of dissatisfaction. Um, so here, again, it, it could be different whether we're talking about a newly formed team or an existing team. Um, so what are the sources of dissatisfaction? What are we hearing from our customers? Um, what sort of pain points do we think we're trying to solve? Um, and again, if we're a new team, we might be making some assumptions. This might be a lightweight conversation for a newly formed team that's starting out uh, on a new product, for example. Um, but particularly for existing teams, I'm expecting we have some, some data. We have some retrospectives that we've been doing. Um, and, and particularly if I'm working with a, a team that has some experience, um, hopefully we can pull some uh, data from their last few retrospectives and talk about that. If necessary, we can run a lightweight retrospective at this stage uh, just to uncover some of those pain points, right? Traditional retrospectives, maybe of what's working well, what's not working well. Um, I also like to use different retrospective techniques. I'm a big fan of the uh, sailboat or the speedboat game. So it's a metaphorical way of, of getting the team to talk about you know, what's, what's anchoring us, what's holding us back, what helps move us forward. Uh, do we all have clear line of sight to the vision? Those sorts of things. So really uncovering um, those sources of dissatisfaction, those pain points, both with our customers and with the organization so that we know what we need to be focusing on as we go forward with the team. Now, this conversation can be sensitive for some teams, right? Because we're trying to uncover some things that, that uh, aren't necessarily positive. So uh, some care needs to go into having this conversation with teams. Again, if I'm working with a newly formed team, there might not be a lot of data there, but we start, we can at least start by establishing a foundation um, and a norm of how are we going to uh, expose this? How are we gonna create transparency as a team so that we can understand what these sources of dissatisfaction might be? And more specifically, how are we gonna be able to respond to them? Sorry, I clicked the wrong thing here and I've lost my place. Bear with me, there it is. All right. The third step in static um, is referred to as analyzing demand. And this is, this is a really interesting one when we're working with teams. So this is about understanding where is the work coming from? Right. So in a traditional scrum team, we all know our product owner is responsible for uh, you know, managing the, the backlog and prioritizing the work for the team. And that product owner is either directly from the customer or representing the customer in some way. And hopefully, at least my opinion, a good scrum team um, is not solely dependent on the product owner. They've got clear line of sight and they've got direct contact with the customer. So with traditional scrum teams, we, we kind of know where the source of demand is coming from in a, in a very simple way as far as the backlog is concerned. But in many product scenarios, we may have multiple stakeholders, multiple customers that have multiple needs and multiple sources of demand. So with a lot of scrum teams, I see a, a very simplistic mindset of, well, product owner tells us what we need to work on and we just pay attention to the product backlog and we pull from that backlog as we need to. Um, certainly in complex environments um, and in very dynamic environments, which a lot of, a lot of organizations are, are, are feeling a high level of volatility and, and dynamic uh, change these days, um, it's not that simple. So I find it to be valuable for a team that we really analyze this and we really understand what are all the sources of demand. Um, and it's not uncommon for a lot of teams that even though we may have a product owner uh, that clearly is helping us prioritize the backlog, there may be other demands that are coming in at the team. So it may not, you know, it may be uh, common for a team to say, well, we're doing this feature development. We've got this product that we're clearly building, but we also have to support production over here for some legacy system or um, heaven forbid, not everybody on the team is fully dedicated to the work and maybe I'm a team member and I, I have this other project that I have to, have to work on. We all know that's not ideal, but that could be the real world. So really getting the team to uh, expose all of the sources of demand 
that they're going to have to be paying attention to is a critical step here. Um, now, some of the things that I like to include is not just the source of the demand, meaning who and, and where is it coming from, but here we also want to talk about what type of work is coming at us. Is it all just new feature work or is it new feature work plus production support work or are there side projects that, that people might be throwing at us? Uh, do we have different stakeholders that, that maybe are going to throw competing priorities at us? It's also a matter of understanding the frequency or the, the pace at which work comes at us. Um, as we all probably know with Scrum, you know, we have the sprint, which gives us this cadence built in this rhythm. So, you know, understanding the, the rate at which work comes at us is somewhat taken care of with the Scrum framework because we have our product backlog and we know that every two weeks we're going to pull or three weeks or four weeks, we're going to pull work in and we're going to deliver uh, to the sprint goal and we're going to try to make sure that we, we get into a rhythm. Um, but the pace at which items actually come into our backlog is more variable than that, right? And so understanding how frequently work comes at us is important. Now in Kanban as a method, which is more focused on flow, right? Work is gonna potentially come at us uh, at any given moment. And depending on how we've defined prioritization of that work, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, we might need to handle that in a very different way, right? So um, I see a lot of scrum teams kind of take this for granted. They, they don't really pay that much attention to the frequency or the pace at which work comes in because they're relying on, let's say a backlog refinement ceremony and a sprint planning ceremony to say, all right, we're gonna talk about what our product owners prioritize and we're gonna pull the work in. Uh, but this expands that thinking. Um, the other thing we can start to take a look at is really understanding what's the level of complexity of that work and how, how does it impact us as a team? So not everything that comes into a team's backlog is gonna be at the same level of complexity um, or of the same level of importance. So these are things that uh, for Kanban teams or rather teams that are using the Kanban method, um, they're thinking about these all the time. And when I, what I've found is when I introduce this type of thinking to teams that are applying Scrum or something else, it really starts to get them to have a deeper thinking of the work and it contributes to uh, shared ownership. So it gets them to really take ownership of that rather than simply you know, relying on the product owner as the responsible person for prioritization. So step four in, in, in static or story four in the workshop is, is now we're gonna analyze capacity. Um, now in an ideal world, we've got a dedicated team working together focused on delivery of a, of a product or a service. Um, that may or may not always be true in the real world. I certainly um, sadly experience a lot of my clients um, struggle with the idea of, of building uh, teams that are, that are dedicated and, and wholly focused on the work. Um, but analyzing capacity is more than just saying, well, I'm, I'm allocated 100% of this team or I'm only allocated 50% of this team. Um, it's also about, or at least the way I've adapted it is also about understanding, do we have the skills and capabilities needed to do the work? So we definitely talk about capacity um, as we're standing up this team, as we're doing the forming. So again, getting clarity uh, as a team that we're all dedicated to the work or not. So if I'm a team member who's, who's unfortunately being split between two teams or two different products, you know, I need to make it clear that this is what my capacity is. This is what I have to contribute on a, on a regular basis as a team. That's certainly one, one level of analysis that we do. But the really impactful analysis in my experience is talking about, do we have all of the core skills and capabilities we need to deliver? Now, when I'm facilitating a workshop with a team, um, I try to, to tune into a couple of things, right? One thing is I'm trying to get a sense of, is this team a group of introverts or extroverts, or maybe there's a mix of them? Um, again, is this an experienced team? Have they been working together for a while? Are they a newly formed team that they don't really know anything about each other? Uh, and the reason I try to kind of uh, determine those two sets of characteristics is because for me personally, I might choose a particular technique given what I'm understanding of the team. And the two techniques that, that I've really relied on the most, and there, there are a plethora of them for sure, 
Uh, but the two techniques that I tend to use is one is called uh, market of skills. And market of skills is a, is a form of a gamification of uh, team forming, et cetera. Uh, if anybody's uh, used market of skills, I'll glance over here to my iPad to see the gallery. Feel free to raise your hand if you've got experience with market of skills. Um, I think it's a really fun technique to use with, with teams, particularly newly formed teams. So if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's uh, think of going to the farmer's market um, or a flea market, if you will. And so, you know, there are these, all these booths and people are, are selling product, right? Whether it's, you know, tomatoes and cantaloupes and, and whatever. Um, and so what we do is, is a group, uh, everybody essentially um, will create some visual representation of their skills that they're bringing to market, market being the team. Um, and so you can have fun with it, which is, which is really cool. And when I'm facilitating a market of skills, for example, I will encourage the, the team to think about a couple of things. Think about what are the core skills we need to, to do the work we're being asked to do, again, based on our understanding of fit for purpose. Um, but I also encourage them to include other things, right? Um, things that may not be directly related technical skills, but maybe they're just some skill that we have. So an easy example uh, that I've seen a lot of people use is if they play an instrument um, or if maybe they're into robotics or they're into other types of, of hobbies. And so those might seem like they're not really important, but they're important from a team forming perspective. And they're important you know, to, to make us all realize that we're human and, and we're not just drones doing technical work or, or running projects or product delivery. So market of skills is a technique that I will use if I'm forming a brand new team. Um, and also if I sense that the team is more you know, comfortable with some extroverted type activities and maybe even open to a little bit of playfulness. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of a cool technique to use. Now, another technique that I use um, in, in another case is what I call just a skills matrix. Now I'll use a skills matrix um, differently. Maybe I've got an experienced team and they've been working together for a while. So it's not so much that they need to form and get to know each other, but they might have a gap in really understanding, um, do we have all the skills we need to do the work? Or maybe we've discovered through the sources of dissatisfaction activity, that we keep having gaps. We keep having to send work or send requests outside of the team because we, we just don't have that particular skill. Um, and the other condition of that might be, well, I've got a real serious group here. There are a lot of hardcore engineers and they're very much about, let's just get down to business, maybe a bunch of introverts. Um, and so the idea of a market of skills, they might, they might roll their eyes at that. But a skills matrix is a really cool technique to use. Um, and essentially uh, how that works is we get together as a team and we talk about what are all of the skills that we need to fulfill the work. And again, we've had these earlier conversations uh, in the workshop of fit for purpose and, and sources of dissatisfaction. So we should have that data. And so what we do is we, we lay out all of the skills that we think we need to effectively deliver. And then each person on the team takes you know, creates a row for themselves. And we normally, in the good old days, when we we're all in the same room, we would do this like a big room activity and we'd have a, a wall that we would use this on. Um, today, I do it in a, in a virtual board, like a Miro or a Miro board. But each individual team member will go through and they will self-assess on all of the skills. Um, and there are various techniques that we can use. You can use a number scale, one to five. Uh, some teams like to use symbols. Um, other teams can do different things, but each individual will go through and essentially self-assess their, their relative level of experience or competency for all of the skills that they've identified that they need to be able to deliver. Once everybody has gone through that as, as an individual, then we step back and then we look at that together as a team. And there's two key things that I tend to ask the team to look at. Number one is let's identify some gaps. So if there's a core skill that we need to deliver and only one person on the team has any level of competency or maybe nobody has any level of competency on that skill, well, then that's an obvious gap that we're gonna to need to address. We're gonna to need to figure out how we're gonna deal with that. Do we need to go recruit somebody onto the team that can provide us that skill or can somebody go get upskilled quickly so that we can um, do that? Um, the other cool benefit of using this technique is, is we can also identify where we might have 
uh, a disproportionate level of novice or no skill to those with experience. I'm a big proponent of building in continuous learning at the team level. So this allows us to start to have conversations around maybe having some mentor or mentee relationships. So let's say there's a particular skill and I'm, I'm a novice, right? I, I know a little bit about the skill, but I'm not comfortable like taking on a task on my own that would require that skill. Uh, but somebody else on my team is an expert. And so we might be able to build a relationship where I can learn from them. They're going to be my mentor. And I think this is a really critical element when we're forming teams, and particularly when we're trying to get long-lived healthy teams, is that we have some level of that continuous learning built into the team and some mentor-mentee relationships. Um, and so this, as you can tell, because of the depth maybe that I went into, as opposed to the other slides, this is a really key activity, I believe, in and getting the teams formed and getting them to think about uh, kind of their, their capabilities as well as their capacity. And again, this is, a, this is a, my adaptation of the official way of, of using this technique within static. The fifth step in static is now we're, we're um, ready to start modeling um, the workflow and, and getting prepared to design our Kanban system. So modeling the workflow is, is pretty straightforward. I think everybody uh, has experience probably doing some process mapping and, and some workflow modeling. Um, I always find this activity to be interesting, um, again, whether it's a new team or a, an existing team. Um, for existing teams, what, what almost inevitably happens when I ask the question of, yeah, everybody understands how work flows to the team and everybody's head nods and sure, of course. Once we start talking about it and more importantly, visualizing it, that's where all of the ahas and the, oh wait, I didn't know you did it that way type of realization starts to pop in. So, um, you know, I'd like to say it was every time, but I'll say virtually every time I take teams through this activity, uh, there's some new information that emerges, even though they thought, yep, we know exactly how work flows. Someone is going to either visualize or identify something that somebody else didn't know. Um, and so this is a, a really powerful activity to get teams to visualize how work is going to flow through them. Now, again, going back to scrum teams, how I use this with scrum teams is that scrum teams um, can sometimes uh, just kind of take for granted, uh, well, we have the sprint and we have our sprint planning and we pull work in and that's how work flows. And we, uh, you know, we set up our, our, our sprint board and we've got our to do and then we're doing stuff and then it's done. Um, but they don't really account for how work is going to flow through them as, as a team, and more importantly, if they have any external dependencies. So modeling the workflow is, is a, a powerful activity as well, so that they can see it, and they can really start to talk about, you know, does this make sense? You know, are we optimized uh, to make sure that work can flow through um, in, you know, in our sprint boundary um, and then making sure that we really understand kind of who's going to be responsible for what. Another element of static is defining what's called classes of service. So those of you that have experience with Kanban, I'm, guess you're, I'm guessing you're quite familiar with classes of service. Um, I, I rarely uh, encounter scrum teams that have had this conversation. So it's, it's again, one that challenges them to think differently. Um, here, what we're really trying to do is, is understand what are the different rules that we're going to need to apply um, based on the different type of work and the different sources of work that are coming at us, right? So, so again, it may not be as simple as, well, the product owner has prioritized the backlog and all we have to do is, is follow what the product owner has prioritized for us. So there may be uh, work that emerges into the middle of a sprint. I'm guessing everybody's experienced that where we're in the middle of a sprint with a scrum team and you know, something's changed, new work flows in or we've learned something. You know, how do we deal with that work? Um, is there a way to reprioritize as we go, or does that work just get thrown back into the backlog and we'll talk about it as we do our next sprint planning, those sorts of things. So the key to understanding classes of service is, is understanding where we have variability in, in the work that's coming at us and how are we going to handle that work and what are the explicit rules or in Kanban, the referred to as explicit policies of how we handle that work. 
Um, so a common example, again, with scrum teams is they're, they're splitting their time, so to speak, between new product development and production support. Uh, so what those, those could be two simple classes of service and what are the rules of how they're gonna handle that work? If a new uh, production support ticket comes in, does everything just get put on hold until we resolve this production support ticket? Or are there other rules about how we're gonna handle that? Does that get triaged in a certain way? Um, did the team plan for that in their capacity? Those sorts of things. And it's important that the team really starts to agree early on on the explicit policies that they're gonna have. This serves two purposes, right? That serves the purpose for the team itself to understand their own rules of engagement and, and how they need to, to think about things on a daily basis, but explicit policies, um, and, and in this case, classes of service, are a really important tool in how we're gonna communicate with our stakeholders. So we make these, these rules uh, transparent to our stakeholders so that they understand what's going on within the team. And so if I put a request into a team, let's say I'm a stakeholder and I put in a request, you know, I need to have an understanding of, well, do I expect the team's gonna work on that right away? Or does it sit in the backlog until the product owner gets around to prioritizing it? You know, what, what's going on there? So having these classes of service and building in explicit policies, which is part of the Kanban method, helps teams both internally as well as externally communicate, have clarity so that they know what's going on. So here's where the cool part comes in, in my mind, right? So now that we've taken the team, we've had these conversations, we've created these, uh, these different artifacts, we've got visualizations that we can talk about. Now as a team, we can start to design our Kanban system. Now for a Kanban team, uh, or rather a team using the Kanban method, right? Um, there is no perfect way to design our Kanban system. Um, and one of the myths that I encounter a lot is, again, as I said earlier, as I teed this up, is a lot of organizations and teams, their, their definition of Kanban is, well, we have a Kanban board, we can show it to you in JIRA, or we can show it to you over here on this physical wall, and that's, that's where they stop. Um, and one of the things that I always like to encourage teams to think about is there is no right or wrong way to design your Kanban system. It should be a reflection of the things that we've just talked about. It should be a reflection of understanding uh, the sources of, of demand, understanding our capacity, understanding how work needs to flow, understanding of what are the classes of service or the policies or explicit policies that we need to be managing. So this is where teams can really be creative and they can design any, any sort of visible Kanban board that's gonna be a good reflection of how they need to work and the things that they need to be doing. Um, now for scrum teams, um, oftentimes, again, they just oversimplify this. They think, well, all we need is the product backlog and we have our sprint backlog. And then we're going to say, this is the work that we're doing. And hopefully they've got nice definitions of done. And then they've got this done column, but works often complex, right? That's why we apply scrum. We apply scrum so that we can solve complex adaptive problems. And so overly simplifying a Kanban system or a way of the work to flow for a Scrum team, I think can, can be a mistake. So I encourage Scrum teams to get creative here as well. And uh, I've seen a lot of really cool uh, ways emerge from teams. Um, they, can, they can really have fun with it, but more importantly, they are now better connected uh, by going through these activities. They're better connected in, in understanding, well, this reflects how we work. This reflects how we're gonna communicate and how things are gonna flow for a team. And it also gives us the visualization that we need so that if things are not going as we expect, we've either got bottlenecks or we've hit, you know, we hit a blocker of some sort, we've got a way to be able to call that out. Um, now in, in the pre-COVID days, uh, I would encourage teams to experiment a little bit uh, first. So that might mean that they start experimenting with just a physical Kanban board and get uh, for scrum teams, get a couple of sprints under their belt. And, and once they kind of figure out and they can tweak it, then they can kind of build that into the tool of choice. Um, that may or may not be you know, uh, an option that they have. And certainly today with, with virtually everybody being remote, um, having physical boards is uh, maybe not 
uh, always going to work. Uh, I have my own personal Kanban board that I play around with uh, this current iteration over my shoulder. I just changed it a couple of weeks ago. I, I like to change up the way I visualize my work. Um, my team can see that on, on every Zoom call that we have. So um, just a little you know, public service announcement that don't let the fact that we're now in this heavy remote context uh, stop us from having physical Kanban boards. I, I really believe in the tactile nature of, of working with a physical board. Uh, it gives us a different level of connection to the work and the why. Um, and so that's just my, my personal way of thinking about that. And then finally, you know, the last step in, in static is now we're going to roll it out um, and we're going to inspect and adapt. Now, again, here's, here's a little, another adaptation that I've made working with scrum teams, particularly, but teams in general is, and this comes from a former colleague of mine, Daniel Lynn, he and I worked together for years at Agile 42. Um, as we ran these chartering workshops and these team forming workshops um, over time, uh, one of the things that we felt it was important to do as we would kind of close out the workshop is do what we call a priming activity. And, and that is essentially, you know, does the team really have everything they need to go out and be successful, right? So the expectation is after we come out of this workshop, uh, we're ready to start doing the work as a team, right? And if it, in the context of a scrum team, here we go, sprint one, we're off and running. And, and we wanna be able to deliver as quickly as possible. We wanna be able to, to, to have confidence that we have what we need. So a priming activity is just a good way to close this out um, to go back and say, uh, for example, you'll see, as you see, I have in the acceptance criteria here is, do we have all the tools that we need uh, to do the work, right? And that could be, you know, again, access to an, you know, uh, a JIRA or a version one type of a tool or a Kanban flow or Trello, whatever we're using to kind of manage the backlog. It could be, do I have access to code base systems, uh, to document management systems, et cetera, et cetera. Do we have all the knowledge that we need? Again, we did the um, analyze our capacity activity and we either did a, we would have done either a um, skills matrix or a market of skills. So we have data coming out of that that informs us. So any gaps of knowledge that we need, those are gonna be amplified here again and, and called out. Uh, do we have uh, any environments and do we have the people that we need? And so we'll visualize this and this is essentially pulling all of that data together so that we can now talk to talk as a team about that. And then we can go talk to others in the organization that might need to help the team make sure that all of these things can be put into place. Um, and that can include identifying also how are we going to communicate and what our definition of, of shippable products is going to look like. So I know this was really kind of fast. I was, I was plowing through this because I wanted to be sensitive on time for everybody. Um, but this is a high level overview of, of how uh, I and some of my colleagues over the years, how we've adapted static um, to be able to be applicable to teams of, of all sorts, um, specifically scrum teams in this conversation, and how we can use this to get teams and individuals to think maybe a little bit differently um, and, and to dig deeper into how are we as a team going to be working and what do we need to be successful? Um, and I've seen a lot of success with that. I do have um, more depth if anybody's interested, as I said, um, I can share with you um, some, some deeper tips and techniques and some formats if you would like to apply this yourself with Teams. Um, I'd be happy to share that with anybody after the fact. And um, I think I'll take one minute if everybody's cool with it, just to kind of give a quick little plug so the company I'm with, Agile Velocity, uh, we've designed a framework called Path to Agility, um, which I like to refer to it as a framework agnostic framework. And it's really more about uh, change management. So how do we help uh, as an organization, how do we help navigate the change process? Um, and how do we uh, contextualize where we are as an organization, uh, whether it's at the team level, the system level, or the org level? Um, so if anybody's interested in that, feel free to reach out. And as I mentioned earlier, I want to provide shout outs to all the thought leaders that, that uh, informed how I approach this and informed 
uh, what, what I found to be valuable. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions? Feel free to just unmute or put them in the chat if you're not comfortable asking out loud. Um, I'll start with one. So um, on your uh, reference sheet that you have there, do you have examples or links to the exercises that you talked about? Yeah, um, so, okay. so one of them from, uh, I mentioned the speedboat, for example, speedboat uh, uh, type activity. Uh, so Lou Coleman, I think was the creator of that. So I, I've used that many times in the years. So I've got a link uh, that I can share out with folks on that. Um, some of the activities are, are ones that I've created myself, so I can certainly share uh, some of those. Uh, I did. I do have a companion uh, blog post for this topic um, that I can point people to as well, and that goes into a little bit more depth, as I said, of the specific techniques and a little bit more description of some of these techniques. I'd be happy to share that with folks after the fact. Okay. Yeah, it looks like people are asking in the comments for that. So that would be mm -hmm. lovely. Sure. Um, how can we reach out to you after this? Do you want LinkedIn connections? Do you have an email? Yes. Um, so you can certainly find me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect with anybody on LinkedIn. Um, just Richard Dolman, D-O-L-M-A-N. You can see in the Zoom. Um, my work email is Richard. I'll just put in the chat here. Perfect. So it's richard.dolman, agilevelocity.com. Um, my, I think this slide from a previous talk is already up on SlideShare. So if you do um, connect with me on LinkedIn, you should be able to access it through SlideShare, um, a, a previous version of this, but um, I'm happy to share the deck as well. And as I mentioned, I also have a, a Miro board for doing this workshop virtually. Um, and I'm happy to share that as well. Um, you know, there's nothing proprietary to any of this. This is just, these are techniques that I've learned along the way that I've found to be valuable and helpful. And I, I'm happy to share that with folks if you wanna give, them, give it a try and practice with it. I would ask that um, certainly if anybody wants to try any of this stuff, um, I would love to hear from you in the future of how well did it go? What did you learn? If you tried something different, you know, what can I learn from that? Because um, I'm guessing that everybody here, uh, if you were to apply some of this, you'll probably apply your own particular style and preferences to it. And I think that's awesome. So I'm always happy to, to hear how people have adapted things themselves and, and improved on some of these things. Yeah, and I appreciate that you mentioned that it's not proprietary because I feel like, you know, if we're gonna call ourselves a community, typically you don't, you know, require a cost or something. Like I feel like we all benefit when we can all learn from each other. So I appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. All right, any questions? I'm looking. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hey, Richard, how's it going? Uh, I used Marketplace of Skills, and that is a fun activity. Nobody's tried that before, and I went through their path to agility. So that's a legit framework. It's, it's a lot, um, but it's, it's really cool. Uh, so my question isn't necessarily about the static method or the static approach to uh, team building, but what about the Kanban method? And I know you took part of this from the Kanban method and adjusted it. Um, yeah. Is the Kanban method through David Anderson's uh, Kanban University, is that something you would recommend for people to, uh, to, to go out, either get a certification or just learn more about? Well, I would definitely say yes to learn more about. Um, okay. um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of Kanban method. Um, and, and again, this, this workshop that I'm talking about here is, is part, of, part of how I uh, approach, uh, you know, again, whether I'm working with a delivery team level or a leadership team level. So um, part of, as a coach, when I go into an organization, um, I try to assess what's their current state. And is, if there's a lot of churn going on and, 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 and it feels like people are kind of struggling with things, um, Kanban is a beautiful method because 
you don't have to change anything right out of the gate, right? It's a method that we apply to our existing way of working. So start with what you know or what you do. And then as you can visualize it, then you can make smart choices of where do we need to make adjustments. So I'm a huge fan of Kanban. So I absolutely agree. Go learn about it if you're not familiar with it. Now, whether or not you are into certifications, that's an individual choice. Um, uh, but, you know, certainly, you know, that's that's something that you can consider as well. But I, I think as Agilists um, or as an Agilist, I, I try to be well-rounded, right? I, I want to be knowledgeable about multiple aspects of these things that may fall under the umbrella of Agile and Lean. Um, and I think there, that makes me a better coach. It allows me a, to bring more to my clients. Um, so I absolutely encourage learning. And then each of you, again, given your context, whatever roles you have in your organizations, whether you're consultants or internal folks, scrum masters, et cetera, then that just equips you that much better, um, you know, having a so-called deeper toolbox so that you have things that you can pull from um, whenever the context changes. Cool. Thank you. You bet. Anyone else? Okay. Well, there, oh, go ahead. There's one. Right. <laughs> so to get to unmute. Uh, Richard, this was awesome. I'm pretty excited to try this with uh, two new Scrum teams who are getting uh, ready to onboard. Um, have you had the experience and the opportunity to try these with Scrum teams? As I mean, it sounds like you've done it with Kanban teams, but have you tried it with Scrum teams before? No, I've, I've explicitly done this approach with Scrum teams. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, so yes, the, um, I, I've lost track, but in, in the dozens, number-wise, of, of teams that are applying the Scrum framework, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've used awesome. this technique with them many times, yes. Awesome. So have you, uh, have you noticed and observed any, any particular differences in, in doing the same exercise with Kanban versus a Scrum team, or does it generally feel the same other than the fact that the framework and the system itself is slightly different. Yeah, um, sure. There, there are always differences across teams. Um, so, you know, a common perception um, is that Kanban fits for service teams and Scrum fits for software or delivery teams. Um, I, I understand the rationale for that distinction. I don't necessarily agree to it, agree with it, um, but um, I think both are valuable, and I'm guessing all of us have probably heard of or seen Scrum Bond. Um, right. Full disclosure, I'm not a fan of that, uh, and, and real quickly, here's why, is because usually the manifestation that I see is this, some, this, this munging together of both, and then it just gets muddy. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't apply both as a team or as an organization, but my guidance to teams that want to use a little bit of Kanban, use a little bit of Scrum is, is, okay, go ahead, but be explicit about what you're doing so that it just doesn't turn into this muddy mess of nobody knows what it is. So that's, that's just my PSA on that. Right. Um, so yes, there are differences with Scrum teams and which is why I think this is a powerful technique because it, it really changes their thinking and, and right. it approaches things that, that they may not be thinking of. And, right. and again, this is just based on the patterns that I see when I go into organizations is, all right, we're going to stand up a scrum team and we've got a scrum master, we've got a product owner, here's your sprint, go. And right. they're, they're not taking the time to really understand the nature of the work, the challenges, et cetera. They're not really designing their system. Mm -hmm. They're just diving in and doing the work. And the cool thing about static is it's a systems thinking approach, right? So we're, we're thinking about us as a system and then we're designing our way of working accordingly. So it's yeah. really powerful, whether you're going to use Kanban as a method, or you're going to use Scrum, or you're going to use XP, or you're going to mm -hmm. use something else. Mm -hmm. I think it's a valuable technique to use for any team that really wants to understand how they need to work as a system, given, you know, the environment they're in. Sure. Yeah. Like I said, it, it seems very powerful. I can't wait to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yep. So I have a question, if I may. Um, it's and it's one of the perennial questions in any agile type setup: management buy-in. Yeah. How how does how does static help grease the wheels on management buy-in? Because my management right now 
they are absolutely convinced that me being the sole scrum master and us having five teams that are distributed between the Rocky Mountains and the Ukraine and everywhere in between, how do we get management to buy in to realize that what they're calling scrum certainly you know, is not yeah. one of the best choices to apply in this situation? Right. Um, great question. I think that is a universal <laughs> question, right? Um, uh, so first, I'm, I'm not sure that what I just presented to you will solve that problem. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain it won't. However, um, we can take the outcome of using this technique and use that to better inform management, to have conversations. So, so that's something that I, that I would do is, is if I have the situation that you just described, Mason, um, I would use the I would use the outcome of this, the information that we gather through doing this type of an activity at the team level, plus other data points that I would have. The obvious of well, Mason's being expected to be a scrum master for five teams across multiple geos, et cetera, et cetera, and look at all the constraints that you're putting in front of him to be successful. So while this technique doesn't solve that problem, it it is a data point or set of data points that you can use to have those conversations. Okay. I, I appreciate that feedback because yeah, it's a very real situation for me. And so I, I, yeah, I do appreciate that. Feedback. I feel you on that. It's a very I, real I'm going to be in touch. Life. I'll be in touch with you. I'd like to chat with you further. Sure, you bet. I have I have a Kanban methodology certification as well. So cool. So I wouldn't be a good scrum master if I didn't call out that we're two minutes from our time box. So um I need to drop off. Christine is going to facilitate the networking afterward if you want to stay on. And Richard, thank you again so much. I really appreciate uh, taking the time me. to present to our group. So thank you.